Hello, my name is Tyler McMinn with Aruba Networks, and this is the Network Essentials video course. We're jumping into looping here in part two of this video series. This is going to be looking out for loops, and ultimately we'll tie in with a discussion on link aggregation. But right now we're going to look at adding an additional redundant link and some of the dangers that are involved with that and how to solve that. So let's jump on in. With redundant links, you have failover. In the event that one of your main links, especially these links that are between, say, your core of your network like this, having a redundancy is always a good idea. It shortens the amount of downtime you would have. It gives you the ability to have, obviously, not just redundant cores, but redundant connectivity between those devices. So while it doesn't necessarily have to be at the core layer, per se, anywhere you have redundant links is generally a welcome addition to your network design and will tend to try and put as much redundancy whenever possible, costs permitting. So when you have a redundant link between two switches, ignoring what's going on down here, um, between just these two access layer switches, for example, though those would really be core switches, uh, that can introduce broadcast storms, multiple frame copies, and ultimately instability of the MAC address table. Basically, bad things happen. Your broadcasts that arrive on a from a host port here are designed to flood across those redundant links, which means they loop around and continue to flood in both directions. So if it was going this way, it would flood around and around and around, uh, essentially infinitely. Multiple frame copies occurs because as it floods out to all of your other connected devices, they too are going to start having redundant frames pop out as much as possible. So they get the same copy of the same frame over and over and over again, as fast as your switch can pump that out. This leads to MAC address instability tables because as your host's MAC address is learned on this interface, as it gets broadcasted around and comes back, it flips from sourcing uh, this port to being sourced from this interface. They now, your switch now is confused and thinks that it's coming from access two. While at the same time, the frame that was flooded on the bottom port arrives on the top. And so it flips from the green port here to this red interface here and back and forth. So it just flips as fast as it can. This ultimately in a production network will not only flood out all your connected interfaces to where they're basically unusable, but it will spike your processor uh, your CPU on your access switches or on your switches in general to 100%, basically shutting down your network. The way to fix this is to disable the port. If you shut down the port that's redundant by physically unplugging it during the this event, it will settle the network down within a minute or so and you should be back to normal, albeit without that redundant link. So the uh, issue with loops is that they provide us a benefit while at the same time kind of enabling a risky proposition. You, while you want to design the redundancy in mind, you would generally want to use a protocol to solve this issue. And this protocol, Spanning Tree, has been doing this for decades and it has many, many different iterations. With CX, we use the version known as MSTP or uh, MST protocol. This is a standard protocol, just like our 802.1Q is a trunking VLAN standard. MST is an 802.1S standard that other switches can support. So it works well with compatibility. And essentially what it does is it takes your switches that all are within the same broadcast domain. So maybe there's a router over here, but these switches are all in the same region, we would say. One of them is automatically elected as the root switch, or you can designate a root switch. And all the rest of your switches will figure out the best path to send their traffic through the route. So the route effectively becomes kind of the hub of your network and any redundant links that are running will have their traffic disabled, at least their user traffic disabled. You still send management frames uh, that switch the switch frames that are needed, um, like link layer discovery protocol, Cisco discovery protocol, 802.3 BPDUs, all sorts of stuff that kind of runs in the background. That's not really important for us at this point. What's important is for us to know is that with the 6000 series switches, this feature of spanning tree is enabled by default. So any 6000, like 6200 or 6300, this spanning tree 
protocol is already running and operating. So we can plug in redundant links without really fear of a network crashing at layer two. With the 8000 series, it's not enabled by default. However, the 8000 series has all of its interfaces routing, they're not switching. And if you're switching, then spanning tree is important. If you're routing on your interfaces, then the risk isn't there unless somebody makes it a switch port. So while it's not on, it's off, spanning tree itself is actually off on these devices, on uh, the 8000. You can enable it if you so choose, but it's not. you're not in any danger unless you s change your port assignment. So we'll talk more about routed ports again in uh, part three. So that is it. In most cases though, you don't wanna have a bunch of redundant links that are just gonna be disabled anyway. These ports can be quite expensive if they're running fiber connections with single mode fiber. The transceivers on these can get a little pricey. So we'd like to have the redundancy, but we'd like to use it. Uh, and instead of having separate roads where we want to think of these as roads, where if they're separate, then they could loop on each other and you could find somebody who's maybe a new driver uh, just going around in circles all the time. So instead, what we would prefer is to treat these as kind of one major road between the two switches, but the physical links themselves could be used as lanes on a highway. Ah, now I could have up to eight lanes of connections between or eight wires connecting my two switches together and we can bundle them together so they behave as if they're a single road. So an eight lane highway or freeway as opposed, if you're from the West Coast, eight lane highway as opposed to individual country roads that you can end up getting lost on and circling back on each other. This little circle icon indicates that we've designed these switch ports to be bundled together. You need to configure these as a link aggregation to allow them to bundle together and you would need to configure them on both switches, both the top switch and the bottom switch or the switches that are plugged into each other. So they would both need to have their own unique configuration in order to uh, form agreement that they're gonna be using a link aggregation. And that's it. Without a link aggregation, poor port utilization, you're, uh, ultimately what would end up happening is all every redundant link would be disabled. So this would be just one primary pathway. Spanning tree would make sure of that. If I added a third link, that also would be disabled. And a fourth link, that would be disabled. Eight links, seven would be disabled. So if seven out of eight roads were shut down for fear of getting lost and looping, not exactly optimal performance there. Some might call it suboptimal performance. So link aggregation makes everything better, improves the bandwidth, gives you better resiliency, allows traffic to be distributed across the port members, where if these were one gig interfaces, I would have a total of two gigs of overall bandwidth. I couldn't transfer it two gigs, but I could transfer two different connections at the same time. So to get an overall amount of bandwidth, like on the interstate, if your 75 mile an hour speed limit is applied and you have two lanes, you can't go 150 miles an hour. You, you and your buddy can both go 75 miles an hour. So this way we can still run spanning tree. It still protects us when we have links to a third switch like this, it would still disable those links, but it would allow us to have high speed connections between our remaining switches. And if you decided that you were gonna use link aggregation everywhere in your network, it would actually end up disabling the link aggregation between these devices. So let's take a look at the mechanics of this because we ultimately want to build this out. And with CX, we refer to a link aggregation as a lag or a, a LAG, link aggregation. You can use the term link aggregation and every vendor will know what you're talking about, but other vendors have other names. In fact, the old Aruba OS operating system didn't call it a link aggregation specifically. They called it a trunk, which is a little confusing given that trunks mean that you can pass multiple VLAN tags on the same interface. So stick with trunking for trunking, access for access, and lag as your link aggregation. You should be good. We're gonna set up a link aggregation as a, its own virtual interface. So these individual ports are no longer gonna be identified as themselves. They're gonna to belong to a new interface 
known as the link aggregation interface, and we'll assign it a unique identifier or a unique number to go along with that. Uh, this will make more sense once you see it actually build out. And then protocols and processes now refer to it as a lag. Broadcast and multicast will actually only use one of the physical links. So if you have a broadcast or a flood multicast, it's, only, it's not gonna replicate eight times across eight wires. You wanna make sure that your ports are basically the same physical type, but they don't have to have the same port number or no, nor do they have to be in the same row of ports, like ports one, two, and three. You could certainly make a lag, but you could use ports one, two, and nine, and that would work okay. But yeah, be wary that your full and du your speed, your duplex settings, whether it's copper or fiber, this can have some mismatches uh, depending on the model number, but generally speaking, best practice, make sure they're the same. And most vendors, including CX, are limited up to eight physical ports in a link aggregation. The good news is there is a protocol that will check this for you. So if you do make a mistake or you misconfigure something, it won't bundle them together and spanning tree will block any additional ports which is better than forming a loop and shutting down your network so the protocol that we're going to institute here is known as 802.3 ad or link aggregation control protocol and we're going to fire that up in our build of this you could use a manual assignment instead but it's recommended in most deployments to, to use LACP, just so you've got a safeguard in case of uh, human error or misconfiguration. So here's the config in theory, and then we're gonna do a lab in the next video where we'll actually employ it. You go under your, create the logical interface first with interface lag, and then give it a number, say five or whatever. Make sure it's a switch port, so no routing, and make sure you enable LACP mode on that so that it is actively checking that you've actually plugged in the right ports to each other. You haven't misplugged things in. Once that's done, it's still not assigned to a physical interface until you go in and you put under the physical interface the command lag and whatever number you used here, that's the lag number you assign to your port or your ports that you're bundling together. So as an example, interface lag one, no routing, LACP mode active, that's your global command. Then you go under the actual interface itself and you say, or interfaces in this case, and under each interface, you would say lag number whatever. We created lag number one, so I'm gonna assign these to lag number one. Lag number one, assign them to lag number one. And while this is good for access one, we're gonna do the same thing on access two when we connect these, except we're not using ports 28 or 27, we're gonna use ports two and six, 112 and 116. So I think that's it. Let's stop the video here. And in the next video, we'll actually follow up and build this out and test it to see that it works. This video, we've just really looked at what link aggregation is and spanning tree uh, as two solutions to solve loops. And generally you wanna run both in the event that somebody does something they're not supposed to, as well as with link aggregation to utilize your all your available links without dropping or blocking them using spanning tree. Thanks again. I'll see you in the next video.